Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puff wheat and Quaker puff rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog Yukon King as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. the breakfast that brings cheers from coast to coast. The breakfast that wins praise from many a He-Man Hollywood movie star, too. It's swell-tasting Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat with milk and fruit. These king size, ready-to-serve premium grains of rice or wheat, are shot from guns. Yes, actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender as nuts in November. Tomorrow, sure, try this thrifty deluxe breakfast treat. <laughs> You'll cheer, too, for Quaker Puff Rice or Quaker Puff Wheat. Following the discovery of gold in the Yukon, Sergeant Preston and his great dog, King, set out from Mackenzie Bay with mail for the schooner Penguin whose master, Captain Beaufort, was engaged in the scientific survey of Arctic waters for the Canadian government. It was in late September, with the first snow heralding the rapid approach of winter, when they reached their destination, a small Eskimo village from which the mass of the anchored sailing ship could be seen some distance offshore. Their approach, Sergeant Preston observed, was being watched by women and sled dogs, the latter setting up a loud clamor. As they neared the group, a powerful but gaunt gray dog sprang from the yelping pack and with bristles raised and fangs bared, lunged toward King, who braced himself for a fight. Ready, King. Watch him, boy. As the huge beast sprang, one of the women lashed out expertly with a whip. The whip curled around the neck of the lunging dog, bringing him to earth with a thud. Looks like that took care of him, King. Now you won't have to fight. As the dog rejoined the pack, abandoning for the time his desire for fight, the woman came forward, her white teeth gleaming in the fading light of afternoon. Sergeant Preston recognized her as the wife of his good friend, Kukluk, chief of the Eskimo village. Is that one of Kukluk's dogs? No, that is Puka, the wild dog. Didn't think I remembered seeing him among the camp dogs last time I was up this way. You say he's a wild dog, eh? Mm, that right. Kukluk thinks maybe tame him. No can tame him. Puka, very bad dog. King was ready to take some of the fight out of him if you hadn't interfered with the whip. Well, uh, where is my good friend Kukluk? Him go to the great ice, hunt for seal. All men in village hunt for seal on great ice. Well, if they return before I leave, I'd like to see Kukluk before I start back. If weather good, they not come back soon. If weather bad, they do come back soon. Sergeant Preston, already feeling the bite of the stiffening wind guessed that he might see his friend after all. Then he pointed to the schooner anchored offshore. When the schooner put into the bay? Two days we see her. Haven't they sent anyone ashore? Nobody come from ship. Oh. Captain Beaufort knows I'm due here with the mail. Well, I'll take it out to them, but I'll have to borrow a boat. Hunters take big boats. Only kayak left here. Only kayaks left, eh? Very well, I'll borrow a kayak and paddle out. I'll have to leave my dog, King, with you. I take good care of King. Now, fella, you're to stay here with Kukluk's wife. The kayak's not big enough for both of us, and I have to take the mail out to catch the boat. I'll be back shortly after dark, so don't worry about me. Watch out for Puka. He's mean. She want to go with you. Yes, but when he sees me put out to sea in a kayak, he'll understand. Come, I get kayak for you. Just so it's large enough to hold me and the mail in this pack here. Mail's for the men on the ship. This one, good kayak. Kukluk made it. Oh, if Kukluk made it, I know it's seaworthy. Now, King, old fella, stay here and be a good boy. Watch out for that wild dog. Kayak, Oh, thanks. 
It was not until Sergeant Preston climbed into the small round opening of the fragile little craft that King fully realized what the Mountie was about to do. It was only then that he knew his master was unaware of the danger that was rapidly descending from out of the gray clouds to the north. The dog, endowed with senses which nature had denied to man, had known for hours that winter, with all its fury, was soon to break upon them. Born of land, it had no terror for him, but the sea frightened him. He voiced a protesting warning as the kayak moved out to shore. Don't worry, fella. I'll be back soon. Come okay. You stay with me. Cutting through the open water, now choppy and white with foam, Sergeant Preston saw the darkening clouds to the north. Against them, he could see the line of white that marked the edge of the great ice pack where Cockluck and his men were hunting seals. He drew the hood of his parka closer about his face and redoubled his efforts at the double-bladed paddle. He maintained a steady pace for half an hour, during which the sea grew rougher and swept repeatedly across the bow of the small craft. As he neared the penguin, members of the crew were watching. They let out a roar of welcome. A few moments later, he was clambering up the ladder to be greeted by Captain Beaufort and a young woman whose blonde beauty was in striking contrast to the drab surroundings. Uh, Sergeant! This is my daughter, Alice. I'm glad to know you, Sergeant Fenton. This is a surprise, Captain. I didn't know your daughter was with you. Oh, yes. I couldn't get along without Alice. Keeps all of my scientific charts and data in order and does all my reference work for me. I'm disappointed, Sergeant. Disappointed? Dad told me so much about a wonderful dog that travels with you. <laughs> King? I expected you to bring him along. He wanted to come, but there wasn't room for both of us in the kayak. I've told Alice King can do everything but talk. He did his best to talk me out of coming here in a kayak. And since making the trip, I know why. The weather? Yes, Captain. It's getting worse for the minute. I'll have to hurry to get back to shore. Well, then, Dad, while you sort out the mail for the crew... I'll take Sergeant Preston to your quarters and prepare the outgoing mate. Good. Let's have it, Sergeant. Here you are, Captain. And of course you'll have time for a cup of tea, sir. <laughs> Why, of course uh... he will. Nobody leaves his ship without a cup of tea and a bit of talk. Then I'll accept. Right this way, Sergeant. All right. After checking the outgoing mail with Sergeant Preston, Alice Beaufort poured tea for her guest and herself, then faced the mountain. Father and I want to apologize for not sending a boat ashore to await your arrival, Sergeant. Well, that's quite all right, though. I did wonder if something had happened to prevent it. Only the unrest of the crew. You see, Sergeant, we've been at sea for more than a year now. Yes, I know. The crew signed on for two years. It'll take another year to finish the scientific survey. But Dad's afraid they'll try to jump ship. He wouldn't even trust two men to go in a boat for you. Oh, here's the captain now. Hey, Sergeant, why didn't you tell us the news when you arrived? You mean about the gold strike? Yes. Gold strike? Where? In the Yukon. The papers are full of it. And my crew's gone wild over the news. Well, honestly, Captain, I forgot your ship's been at sea so long. I had no intention of concealing big news like that. Our papers are right over here, Dad. Let me open them and read about it. Right ahead, Alice. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston can tell us about it. Gladly, Captain. First strike was made right after you... While Sergeant Preston told about the Klondike strike, the crew of the Penguin read the thrilling story. The men were seized with the same frenzy that sent gold-crazed men and women rushing into the far north. After more than a year of confinement and dreary isolation in the polar seas, the newspaper accounts of the gold strike and fabulous fortunes fanned the smoldering embers of unrest into flaming revolt. Up for going after some of that gold! We have to wait for another year. There won't be none left. There's plenty of supplies aboard the grub state in the lot of us. There's Eskimo dogs aplenty in the village ashore. We'll slit the throat of any man that tries to stop us. Skids Larson, the mate, and Johnny Tatum, the bosun, both of whom had remained loyal to Captain Beaufort, listened in silence as the spirit of mutiny mounted. Then Johnny Tatum looked at the mate and asked, What do we do about it, Skids? They're going to jump ship. There's only one thing we can do, Johnny. Can't stop them, so we might as well join them. They'll cut our throats if we try to stop them. We've got to act fast, though, before they jump us. Now, watch me. What are you going to do? I'm going to take over. Listen, men. Now, quiet down. Quiet. Me and Johnny Tatum are with you. But if we're going to jump ship, we've got to make a good job of it. We've got to make it look like we had to pull out. Otherwise, it's mutiny. What do you mean, skids? You know what they do to mutineers. They'd hunt us down and hang the lot of us. But if we have to abandon ship for a good reason, we're in the clear. How can we do that? Right this minute, the skipper and his daughter are in quarters with that Mountie, Sergeant Preston. The first thing we do is see that they stay there. That's the idea. How are we going to do it? I'll tell you. 
Post up about a dozen of them big crates out of the hold. When that's done, I'll give you more orders as to what to do. Don't forget, there's a storm brewing. We got to get off this ship soon, or we'll never reach them gold fields. Johnny's right. Now get moving. Come on, let's go, boys. Even as the crew manned the winches, hauling up crates from the hold, the wind was howling through the bare masts and riggings of the craft. And darkness began to close down like the lid of a giant eye, trying to shut out sight of a terrifying crime in the making. Inside Captain Beaufort's cabin, Sergeant Preston rose from his chair. I'm sorry, Captain, but I'd best be getting back to shore. The trip back's going to be rough. Dad, you're not going to let him go ashore in that little kayak, are you? Uh, certainly not, Alice. I told Mate Larson to have one of our boats ready and manned. If they mount here aboard, the boat crew wouldn't think of jumping here. You can tow the kayak to shore behind the boat, Sergeant. Yes, I certainly appreciate the lift. I'll see that your boat crew returns to the fender. Uh, what? what was that? Something banged against the door. Uh, I'll see what it was. There it is again. Open the door, Dad. What's this? The door. It's barricaded. Captain, this is the only door out of your quarters? It's the only door out of this cabin. You out there, open this door. Check it out, Captain. You do as I say. Open this door. We're going after gold. This is mutiny. That's right, Captain. It's mutiny. We're, we're trapped. There's no other way out. We've got to try to break out. You'll have to help, Alice. Ready? Yes. Let's go. <coughs> uh, it won't budge. Oh, they're piling something up. We can't move it now. It's evident what they're going to do. Jump ship. Uh, but the fools. They know they can't get away with this. Listen. That's the anchor chain coming in, isn't it? Yes, Sergeant, that's it. That means only one thing, Captain. They intend to set us adrift in a storm. We can't get away with it. We'll cut our way out with the axe. Alice, give me the axe. I'll get it. Won't take long to cut our way out, Captain. No. Out of the way, Captain, while I start swinging. I'll relieve you in a few minutes. There goes. Huh? Oh, it's broke. Yes, it's broken. Handle cracked on the first blow. Have you another? No. That's the only one in the chest. Well, Sergeant, it looks like they may get away with this mutiny after all. We'll never get out of here. We'll continue our story in just a moment. You know, fellas and girls, I was out walking the other night. It was a beautiful night, full moon and everything. And, well, sir... Maybe you won't believe it, but here's what happened. Hello down there. For a moment, I didn't realize who was talking to me. Hello. Then I saw him. Say, aren't you... Yes, I am the man in the moon. Gee, I've often seen you, but this is the first time I've had the pleasure of talking to you. I don't talk to everyone. But why favor me, Mr. Man in the Moon? I want to compliment you. About what? About giving all the boys and girls such good advice. You mean telling them to eat a good breakfast and that nothing tastes sweller than delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice with milk and fruit? Precisely. Well, I don't want to brag, but I must admit that wheat or rice shot from guns are exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. What's more, I think it's important to tell all the fellows and girls that Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are good for them. They furnish added food values of restored natural great amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Good advice, that. But say, Mr. Man on the Moon, how do you know so much about wheat or rice shot from guns? We don't sell Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice up there on the moon. I am old and wise. The man in the moon knows many, many things. Well, that's all for now. Goodbye. Well, sir, fellas and girls, what do you know about that? One thing, though, and this is for sure. Unlike the man on the moon, you can always enjoy nourishing, tasty breakfasts of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice morning after morning. Grocers everywhere down here have crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns. But mind you, it's never sold in bags or bulk. Always look for the famous big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That way you're sure to get the original, the one and only, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Now to continue our story. 
Meanwhile, on deck, boats were being lowered into the sea. Those which were not to be used by the mutinous crew were being smashed with axes and made useless. This done, the crew clambered over the side of the ship and into the boats. All but Skids Larson and Johnny Tatum. The latter stood posed with an axe beside a barrel of oil. Knock her open, Johnny. <coughs> there she is. Set her fire, Skids. As the axe crashed into the barrel head, the oil flowed over the deck. Skids Larson swung the lantern he held in his hand, smashing it into the deck and the flowing oil which caught fire. Under the impact of the high wind, the flames leaped toward the sky, climbing the outspread sails and rigging like a crimson serpent. Come on, Skids, we got to get off. <laughs> ah, they can't hang sailors for abandoning a burning ship. <laughs> All right, Johnny, let's get to the boat. As smoke crept into the master's quarters, the plight of Sergeant Preston, Captain Beaufort, and his daughter Alice seemed hopeless. But even in the desperate knowledge that it was only a matter of perhaps half an hour before they would die, Sergeant Preston refused to give up. Taking several signal rockets from a chest, he fired them through a porthole. When the last one had been sent into the sky, he sat down. The three stared at the barricaded door in silence. Alice finally began gathering up documents and records. Alice, what are you doing? I'm putting all your records in this potato and stuck it into this small chest. What for? They may be saved, even if we can never be. What are you talking about? We can shove the chest through the porthole. We'll drop it into the sea. Good idea. Maybe picked up by a vessel or might even drift ashore. If it is found, your work won't have been in vain, Captain Bolton. Oh, yes, I see. It is all important that my records be saved, if possible. What was that? Somebody's outside that door. It must be the crew. They've come back for something. No, I don't think so. Listen. The alarm with rifles. My good friend, Sergeant Preston. Look like in the steel hunters. Yeah, we see signal shoot in the sky. We know somebody on ship. Oh, we're safe. Well, come quick. Money both save you to shore. Oh, no. no. Get up. In a matter of seconds, Captain Bulford, his daughter Alice, and Sergeant Preston were over the side of the burning ship and in the walrus hide boats of the hardy seal hunters, who had seen the rockets and come to their rescue. Meanwhile, on shore, the great dog king paced up and down at the water's edge, Cuckluck's wife beside him. He saw the ship far out in the bay break into flames as the last ray of daylight faded into the stormy sky. <laughs> He knew the meaning of fire, and it struck terror to his great heart, for he knew his master had rowed out to that same ship only a short time before. Cockluck's wife tried to comfort him. Sergeant Preston, him come soon, please. Him come soon. A pack of Eskimo dogs the hunters had left behind set up a mournful chorus nearby. As excitement and fear gripped the women of the village, King saw a streak of fire shoot out from the ship, arch into the sky, and fall into the sea. Then another, and another. He remembered that he had seen the shooting fire before, when miners marooned on a mountaintop had signaled to Sergeant Preston to save them. He knew it meant somebody needed help, and that somebody was on the burning ship. Casting away his natural fear of the sea, he plunged into the icy surf. No, no but Cutbuck's wife knew it meant quick death to the great dog. She raced in after him, sunk her strong fingers into the shaggy mane, and held on, dragging him back each time his plunging paws lost touch with the sand. They could be seen by the women who had lighted fires along the shore to guide their own men folk safely to the village. They could be seen by the pack of huskies now pacing the shore excitedly. Leading them was Puka, the wild dog that Cuckluck had been unable to tame. Puka saw that the woman now held no whip in her hand, and without it he had no fear of her. Gone, too, was the man in the great fur parker who walked beside the strange dog. With a snarling yelp, he lunged into the struggle, the pack of village dogs at his heels. In the flickering light of the campfires lining the shore, King caught a glimpse of the rushing fury that hurled itself in his throat. <laughs> Cutluck's wife was almost knocked down as the bodies of the two great beasts came together with a loud impact. Extricating herself from the pack of snarling, fighting dogs, she saw King run to firm ground, where he turned to face the oncoming pack. Weak and foolish huskies raced at him only to be ripped and torn by the flashing fangs and hurled yelping among the excited women. Only Puka, the wild and untamed, continued to bore in. Time and again, the two great dogs came to grips, then rolling over and over, each seeking the other's throat. It was a battle of the mighty. Dogs and women stood about in a great circle, watching, waiting breathlessly for the kill. Then they saw the flashing fangs of the great dog king strike home, not in the throat, but back of the pointed ears of Puka. 
Puka went flying through the air to land on the pack of yelping huskies. Slowly, the beaten Puka got up from the snow-packed shore. Slowly, he faded into the darkness. And as the women knew full well, never to return. King waited until Puka had disappeared from sight. Then he stalked slowly toward the pack, fangs bared. They did not run, only drew aside to let him pass. It was a challenge they had no desire to accept. To them, this stranger from the south was king in more than name only. So intent had dogs and women been on the great battle between King and Puka that they failed to hear the muffled sound of men's voices and creaking boat oars approaching from the storm-tossed sea. But King heard them and sounded a joyous welcome. Men, come in both. As the mutinous crew of the penguin pushed ashore, King raced among them, seeking his master. For the moment, he paid no heed that these men were armed, his only interest being in finding Sergeant Preston among them. And then, one word caught his ears, as the man he now realized was the leader spoke roughly to Cuckluck's wife. Huskies. You know what I mean by huskies. Mm, huskies. Dogs. That's right, dogs. you got to have plenty dogs. You get huskies. Plenty huskies. You know. Take Huskies. Cucklock not like you take his dog. We don't give a hoot what Cucklock likes. We're taking every Husky you've got. King saw the leader of the men threaten Cucklock's wife with a gun he held you, in his hand. You bad. He was about to spring at him when it dawned on him what the men were about to do. They were going to take the pack of Huskies that now trailed at his own heels. All right, men. Get the supplies out of the boats. Then we'll round up this pack of Huskies and some sleds. <laughs> King knew Cucklock's wife didn't want the dogs taken from her, knew that she was afraid of the men with guns. As the mutineers moved toward their boats to unload them, King barked sharply. He moved slowly from the rim of firelight, driving the whining pack along the shore. In a matter of seconds, they were swallowed up by the Arctic night. But King did not stop near the camp. He kept going until his alert ears could no longer hear the voices of the men unloading boats. So now and then he had to pause to whip a faltering husky back into the pack. <laughs> Suddenly he caught the sound of voices, heard the rhythmic splash of paddles striking water. All sounds came from over the water, and he paused to listen, the pack of huskies drawing up in a half circle behind him in silence. Campfires ahead, Cucklock. What are those fires? Women build fires on shore. We see fire. No, not our village. You see, Alice, sort of a beacon guiding the men safely home. We soon there. You be safe, Pat. Well, I'm glad these hunters are well armed. My crew may still be there. They've had time to steal the dogs and sleds. They won't wait. They won't? Why not? The men have a lust for gold. They can't rest until they get it. I guess they're on the trail south now. And we won't stand a chance of getting them. No, not tonight. Even if we could, which is doubtful, they're heavily armed. Me, your dog bark. So did I. Listen. Dog's not in village. Him off from village. You're right. That's King. And he's part of the south of the village. You mean you can tell the bark of King from another? I'd know King's bark anywhere, and that's he. It's not in the village where I told him to stay, so he's got a reason for leaving. King, mighty smart dog. Must have heard my voice over the water. Uh, King, bark for you. Call your hunters. Tell them not to approach the village, but to follow the sound of that dog's bark. We tell hunters what you say. Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! The fleet of seal hunters turned in the direction from which came the steady barking of the great dog, King. Meanwhile, consternation had broken out among the mutineers in the Eskimo village. Johnny! Yes, yes. Where are the dogs? We're set to load up and head south. Been looking all over for the dogs, kids. It disappeared. Isn't that a dog in camp? Oh, there's not, huh? Men! Bring that Eskimo squaw over here. Now, listen a moment. What'd you do with the dogs? Me not hide dogs. You're lying. Tell us, kids, what you did with them. Dogs run off. Me not hide dogs. If you know what's good for you, you better tell where they are. I'll give you less than a minute to start talking. Me tell truth. Dogs go away. Give me that dog whip, Johnny. Yeah. Hey, yes, uh, kids. Now, uh, maybe this will help you talk. <laughs> hey, it's that big dog we saw me landed. Shut him. Get him. Oh, you don't that guy. It's him. It's Samani. Holy pink. Taken completely by surprise, the mutineers of the penguin turned to see a lone man, Sergeant Preston, emerge from the darkness into the rim of light cast by the campfires. 
but the surprise soon passed in the realization that they outnumbered him ten to one. In the name of the Queen, I arrest you for mutiny and attempted murder. <laughs> you hear that, man? The sergeant's going to arrest a lot of us. <laughs> I warn you to surrender. You're surrounded. <laughs> oh, this is the first time I was ever surrounded by one man. <laughs> put up! Put up! Put up! Hey, put up! Eskimo! Yes, Eskimo hunters and everyone armed. This camp open and the girl. For the last time, surrender in the name of the queen. Kids Larson and his mutinous crew stood tensely, undecided for a moment. But as the fur-clad hunters, their rifles leveled, appeared from out of the darkness into the firelight, the men from the Penguin knew Sergeant Preston had spoken the truth. Resistance would be useless. Their own weapons dropped in their hands as they raised their arms above their heads. The mutiny of the Penguin was over. A short time later, Captain Beaufort bestowed his blessing on his rescuers. Well, my ship is lost. My life and my daughter's life have been saved. And, Dad, we still have your record. That's right, Alice. Sergeant, I, I can never repay the debt I owe to you, King and Cutluck. I owe my life to Cutluck and his others, too, Captain. But we'd have been killed when we landed if it hadn't been for King. Now, uh, let's get these prisoners ready to march. Doc Luck and his hunters will go with us as guards until we reach the first outpost. One king. King saved everybody. Yes, Doc Luck. The king hadn't heard my voice coming over the sea. It had come straight into an ambush. But thanks to him, the mutiny on the penguin's over. <laughs> yes, boy. Thanks to you, the case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's program. Ask Mom. She knows. Yes, Mother knows there's nothing like a family that's a breakfast happy family. So here's a tip. Ask her to serve delicious Quaker puff wheat or Quaker puff rice for breakfast tomorrow. Everyone goes for these crisp, tender, king-sized kernels of premium wheat or rice shot from guns. Just remember, they're never sold in bags or bulk. To get the original, crisp, fresh, wheat or rice shot from guns, always look for the big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That way, you're sure to get the one and only Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the adventure of Old Moby's Cairn. Old Moby had left his doomed ship in the Arctic Ocean near Herschel Island and had concealed his treasure beneath a pile of rocks in the northernmost part of the Klondike. The treasure proved to be bait that lured men to their death on top of the world and almost cost me my life. Be sure to hear this exciting story Wednesday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Cake Quaker Puff Rice. So long. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>